First Christian Church of Pomona has, since our formative years, been uh, dedicated to mission work. And I'm going to read um, Matthew's version of a mission that the disciples, called apostles, were sent on. This is Matthew 9, chapter 9. And I'm going to begin at 35 and go through chapter 10. Oh, I think I'm going through part of of, of five or six. I'll decide when I get there. Then Jesus went all about the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and curing every disease and every sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them or for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Then Jesus summoned his 12 disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to cure every disease and every sickness. These are the names of the 12 apostles. First Simon, also known as Peter, and his brother Andrew, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector, James, son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus, Simon the Canaanian, and Judas Iscariot, the one who betrayed him. These 12 Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Go nowhere among the Gentiles and enter no town of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Back in the day, mission work was inextricably tied to evangelism, and evangelism was all about saving souls, and more importantly, (laughs) adding numbers to the membership role. Uh Uh-huh. The church at one time, this church at one time, supported what were called Living Link uh, missionaries. We supported eight of them. And that meant that the church raised the money to fully fund their mission, direct support, fully fund them, and if they had a family, their families. Missionary support is now a much more collaborative effort across our denomination, and that's true for all mainline churches. Um, We call our fund the Disciples Mission Fund, and it funds lots of different ministries of our denomination. Ministry efforts were also important at home. This congregation helped found the first Church of Christ in Brawley, California. How about that? (laughs) It still exists. (laughs) It is not a Disciples Church. It's, It's one of the streams of what we call the Restoration Movement. It is a Church of Christ. The major emphasis of mission work, however, was outside the United States. Disciples had a presence in many, many countries, including what was the Belgian Congo. It was an occupied territory ruled by King Leopold's occupational government in the late 1880s. If you'll remember, 1883 was when this congregation was founded. Political corruption was rampant in the Belgian Congo. Violence was regularly perpetrated upon the people for whom it was their home. And the abuses of the rubber industry on the land and on the people was very oppressive. Some missionaries, they just kept their heads down because if you got into trouble with the occupational government, you were out, your mission was done. But some missionaries, Um, had their heads up a little bit. And uh, some of them were disciples who wrote letters to foreign newspapers, essays about what was really happening on the ground in Belgian Congo. Today, the Democratic Republic of Congo still suffers from the extractive political legacy of colonialism, as do many nations across the world. Missionary work of the last 400 years leaves a very complicated legacy, continues to play out on the geopolitical stage. 
It's a legacy that we have become more aware of, and most churches, or at least mainline churches, have transformed their approach. Instead of parachuting in with our expertise, our assumptions that our cultural and religious views are superior, we partner with people in places who are already meeting expressed needs, who know what the needs are on the ground of the people who live there, because they are also the people who live there. It's a very different approach to, to mission work. To be fair, most disciples' mission stations were service-oriented, hospitals, health clinics, schools. It was assumed, though, by most churches in the States that, was, that also included was the winning of souls and teaching their particular aversion of Christianity. For us, the restoration form of primitive Christianity, and for the Presbyterians, Calvinism, and for the Congregationalists, Congregationalism, and the Bab you know, everybody had what they thought was the right form of Christianity. When it was learned that missionaries in Congo were allowing unbaptized people to partake of communion, yes, someone took a deep breath of air. It was scandalous. It was scandalous. And congregations pulled their funding or decreased their funding or threatened to pull their funding, including this congregation. Mm, yes, it's true. Dr. Royal Dye and his wife, Eva Dye, served in the Belgian Congo for many years. Hi, Heidi. But had to leave due to health problems. Eva was, was in bed more than she was out of bed while they served there. They chose Pomona as their home when they came back to the States. And they joined this congregation. This was back in 1910. That's over 100 years ago. That's a long time ago. They started the School of Missions in 1910, and it took many forms over the next 70 years. Folks, that's two generations that the School of Missions, in a variety of forms, was a foundational spiritual formation ministry of this congregation. And children were included in it as well. It wasn't just for the adults. It was all ages. Staying up to date with the global mission of the church kept the Pomona congregation looking outward, beyond itself to the needs of the world. Amid the complications of our missionary work, benefits for all mainline churches include a growing co cooperation among denominations. At first, they did this thing called comedy, comedy, not comedy. There was probably some of that too. But they divided up countries. You get this part of Korea, we'll take this part of Korea, you get this. Seriously, that's what they did. But on the mission field, they came to understand we need each other. We need each other. So there was more cooperation. Um, and some of the, the positive legacy is the churches that are, have grown in those places are united churches. They're not necessarily this denomination or that. The other um, positive outcome is more people in the pews became aware of the geopolitical realities from the perspective of the people in those countries, the people who lived there. It helps us be better global citizens when we allow ourselves to learn from our ministry partners today. So you're gonna start seeing in the caller regularly um, something from our ministry partners from around the world. We need to be good global citizens. Jesus did not create a mission station. He sent 12 of his followers out to extend the work that he was doing. Up to that point, it had been a one-man show, right? And if Jesus' mission was to continue, it needed to extend beyond him. Jesus' own mission is eschatological. That means it's concerned with things related to death, to judgment, to the culmination of things, and yes, the fate of the soul the destiny of people in the here and now and the hereafter. Jesus cared about people's destiny. 
And from where he stood, there were a lot of people whose destiny was tied up with the house of Israel and were lost to it. And that's not to say that their souls were lost, but they were discarded. They were disregarded. Jesus' mission was Jewish. He was a Jewish person. He was a rabbi. The focus of his teaching and healing ministry were the people in his own religious tradition. The missionary focus of the early church and in Matthew's community was likewise Jewish. This is why we get these explicit instructions to go only to the sheep of the house of Israel. Missionaries of the last 400 years, they were in part motivated by a concern for the destiny of people's souls. Though I don't know that they saw those souls, their potential converts, with compassion, or even worthy of their compassion. And uh, there's a lot of evidence to the contrary. that uh, Jesus' mission was prompted from a place of compassion of feeling with the circumstance of the people he sought to heal and help. Matthew likely wanted those who heard and read this story to identify with the apostles, to see themselves authorized, endorsed by Jesus, to extend the mission of his compassion. The story was and is often used, I've heard it used this way, as an example of what Christians today are authorized to do, even required to do. This passage about the harvest being plentiful and the laborers few was, and I've heard it used this way as well, is used to cajole, nag, <laughs> dare I say manipulate people to work harder for the sake of the church. Go out, bring those people in. <laughs> there are churches that have quota expectations of their members, as in how many new people you're supposed to bring into church. It's a sort of religious multi-level marketing scheme. Mm -hmm. This passage isn't about laborers going out to get more laborers in, and it should disabuse every congregation from ever saying, and I know a lot of us have heard this, we need more people to join the church so they can, you fill in the blank, serve on the board, host calf coffee hour, plan programs, wash the dishes, <laughs> whatever it may be. <laughs> the stated expectation is that the 12 will go out to the people to care about them, to care for them, to care for their destiny. That is a very, very different kind of harvest. We are also likely meant to identify with the 12 and see ourselves as further extensions of Jesus' hands and feet, of Jesus' compassion in the world. So we are invited to know ourselves authorized by Jesus for the work of compassion. We are an authorized franchise of the body of Christ, people, and we are in this season of Pentecost endorsed by the Spirit. We may also identify, though, with the harassed and the helpless in this passage, the people who are lost, whose souls feel worn out and ragged. When we feel like that, being sent out, go out and do all of this, we may say, oh, that's outside my wheelhouse right now. We need a mission station to fuel our spirit, to center our soul, to remember that we too are held in and by God's compassion. We are beloved of God. We are part of this enormous cloud of witnesses in the here and the hereafter. Someone cares about your destiny. Receiving this gift again and again, we we allow that love to spill over, that love of God spilling into the world. We must practice receiving that gift, that gift of compassion and grace from God in order to let it flow, to let it flow without an agenda, <laughs> hidden or otherwise. It's like Pam said at the beginning, to love without reward or expectation. 
That's, that's how deeply grounded and connected to the Spirit we have to be. I guess what I'm trying to say that it, it's difficult to identify with the 12 going out if we aren't also identifying with the helpless and the harassed who receive, who accept the compassionate presence of Christ. It isn't either or. We're, we're in both places depending on what's happening with us. And as we imagine ourselves in this week ahead, what will we do to continue to, to do what allows us to, to be open to God, what allows God to fill us up every day? It, it might be as simple as giving thanks for some of the gifts that you receive each day as we wash our hands. Oh, thank you, God. <laughs> I've got clean water. Wow. Taking a deep breath. Oh, I'm alive, and I can breathe. Or the sound of bird song, or, or simply words of prayer. There are infinite possibilities, infinite ways to connect with the infinite God. As we imagine the week ahead, I hope you will imagine tomorrow and the next and the next, and see yourself in it and see yourself extending the grace that you receive from God, extending it in acts of kindness, patience, and compassion. Amen.